Okay, we should get started. Um, <clears throat> so we had been talking about translational motion. Translation is when you change the location of something. So when the center of mass, the very center of this thing is moving along, then I would say it has translational motion because its location is changing with time. Its location is given by a, a position vector r. So these are the steps we took. The location is given by a position vector r. The velocity vector tells us the rate of change of the position vector. So it's the derivative of the position vector with respect to time. The momentum was a velocity vector times the mass. So when we start talking about, when we take the next step and introduce interactions, so this next step introduces interactions, this is really Newton's second law. When we introduce interactions, it, it turns out the mass is important. I, I think you already knew that. I, I think that, that if a, a, a tennis ball had come floating in at five miles an hour and I did like that and stopped it and made it move in a different direction, you wouldn't be surprised. But if a, if a giant train engine came floating in at five miles an hour and I swatted it and it did anything other than continue on at approximately five miles an hour, if it just kind of shot off in another direction, you probably would have been surprised at, at uh, either how strong I was or, or how that uh, train engine is just really a balloon. Um, so mass is important. The reason mass shows up here is that it tells you about, you, you could call it the translational inertia. The mass tells you how hard it's going to be to change the motion of the thing. And that's what's represented here in, in Newton's second law. If I want to change the momentum, and the momentum has both mass and velocity in it, if I want to change the momentum, I need to apply a force from the outside or a bunch of forces that don't cancel each other out, and I need to do that for some amount of time. If that giant uh, train was, was moving in here at five miles an hour and I pushed on it, and I kept pushing on it for a long time, an hour, two hours, a day, eventually I could stop it. Even though I don't apply very much force, I could stop its momentum. I could change its momentum and make it zero if you gave me enough time. So that's what this delta T is. If you apply a force over enough time, you can make any momentum change you want to. As I said last time, there, there's another kind of motion. Every time I throw this thing up, sure it goes up in the air, but it does something else, it spins. I can hardly throw it. I just can't throw a knuckleball straight up into the air, or even knuckleballs spin. I, I can't throw it up so that it doesn't spin. It spins every single time, no matter how hard I try to make it not spin. It's doing one other thing besides going up in the air. It's rotating. So if translations are changing the location of an object, then rotations are changing its orientation. So this... Uh, spot here that used to say something on it, I can't imagine what kind of, there's no way I can read it, but it was the kind of, uh, it was the manufacturer of the ball. If that spot is suddenly on the bottom, then I've rotated it, I've changed its orientation by 180 degrees. And the way I did it was, was rotate it like this, so I changed its orientation around a horizontal axis. I just rotated it around that axis. The axis of rotation is going to be important. Uh, last time I also mentioned how you measure rotational motion, how you measure the orientation. We do it with an angle. And I think I 
we called this piece of tape at the bottom zero, and I called that pi over two, or you did, and pi, and three pi over two, and two pi, and four pi, and six pi. If you measure the angles and radians, then all of the equations I write down will, will always work. And if you measure angles in degrees, well, a lot of them will still work, but, but some of them won't. So good idea to just keep radians all the time. The rate of change of the angle is called the angular velocity. If this angle is changing quickly, then it has a large angular velocity. If it's changing slowly, it has a slower angular velocity. This thing is going to be slowing down just because of friction. Um, and we'll talk about why it slows down in a second. What I want to point out is, this, is that I've drawn a vector over this. So we're going to give angular velocity a direction. And I don't think I got to it last time. The direction of the angular velocity, maybe I'll say this first. Um, if you think about the actual velocity, think about the rubber in this wheel. Pieces of this wheel over here are moving straight up. Over here, pieces of the wheel are moving straight down. So some are moving up, some are moving down, some are up here, they're moving that way, and down at the bottom, they're moving to your right. So they're moving in their velocity, actual translational velocity vectors, there's all directions in this plane. They're translational velocity directions, V, of the pieces of this thing are all in the plane of rotation. In other words, they're all perpendicular to this axis. So, and, and there's, a, there's a translational velocity vector for every direction in that plane you want to pick. All directions are there. So there's nothing special about those. And the only special direction that we have is along the axis perpendicular to the plane. And so, as a convention, we're going to use that direction for the angular momentum, sorry, for the angular velocity vector, omega. This is the little Greek letter omega, by the way. The angular velocity vector is going to be along the axis of rotation. So that gives us two choices. Along, this is a horizontal axis. Either the, it could point toward you or it could point away from you along that axis. And this right-hand rule is how we're going to choose the direction. So the right-hand rule is uh, you have a right hand. You could use your left, but then it would just be opposite. But anyway, let's not. Let's use your right. Your thumb is perpendicular to your fingers. If this thing is rotating like that, if you move your fingers along the direction of rotation, your thumb tells you the direction of the angular velocity. If I move my thumb, my fingers along the direction that this is actually moving, then my thumb, as I move it around here, is always pointed toward you. Any piece of this, it, you, any piece of this that you point your fingers along the actual rotation will, will tell you that the angular velocity points toward you. What about the other direction? What's your, ang what's your right hand rule? What's right hand tell you? Direction of the angular velocity, well, this is clockwise. It's the opposite of counterclockwise. So it would be good if it were in the opposite direction. And I think your right-hand rule will tell you that it points away from you. Um, I asked this one last time, so I'm not going to ask it again. Uh, two objects going around one time, so two pi. Radians every second have the same, the same magnitude, angular velocity, and in fact the same direction. So this was the, the, the gentleman bug had the, had the angular speed same as the ladybugs. Angular speed, by the way, is the magnitude of the angular velocity. Just like speed is the magnitude of the velocity vector. 
So here's a question I haven't asked you yet. There's an angular velocity vector, and I'd like you to tell me the direction of the angular velocity vector, uh, however you can do it, but I would suggest you use a right-hand rule. 